uh, Crohn's. Oh, thank you. Um, so for those of you that weren't sure which one it was, um, and if you weren't sure about the colonoscopy findings, the fact that it's right iliac fossa makes you think that it's related to the terminal ileum and Crohn's affects that area of the gut the most. So that's kind of another one of your clues why it's C over B. Okay, second SBA. Okay. So um, most people have gone for B, which is great. Um, so this was another case where we're kind of trying to differentiate between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So I'm glad um, no one's put Crohn's. Um, so here we have um, a female who has presented with knee joint pain, which is quite a strange thing to come up in a um, gastro lecture, I'm sure you're thinking. She's lost weight and she has bloody mucoid diarrhea and pain is in the left lower quad quadrant. So not in the right like before. Um, it's intermittent and she has red eyes. So depending on how much you know about ulcerative colitis, you might be wondering why there's so many things not related to gastro in this. We will go over that. Uh, but essentially this is quite a classic presentation of ulcerative colitis. Good. Okay, so Crohn's and ulcerative colitis can be grouped in something called inflammatory bowel disease. So a lot of the time in SBAs and also in real life, when you see someone with these kind of symptoms, you might be wondering which one of the two it is. So you often see them compared um, and it will definitely count as part of your differentials. So we're gonna go through exactly what the similarities and the differences are between uh, these two diseases. So starting on the left with Crohn's disease, so it's characterized by transmural inflammation of the GI tract, which means that basically every single layer of the um, GI tract is affected. Whereas if you compare ulcerative colitis, it's just the mucosa and the submucosa. Crohn's typically affects the terminal ileum. So if you remember in our first question, it's why that man had pain on his right side and why the female in the second question, who had ulcerative colitis, had abdo pain on the left side. So in Crohn's, you get diarrhea and it may have blood mixed in. So just because there's blood in the diarrhea, don't automatically think ulcerative colitis. It's less common in Crohn's, but it definitely can still happen. Um, abdo pain we discussed was right side. You get mouth ulcers, perianal lesions, and you might have weight loss. Ulcerative colitis, you get diarrhea with the blood mixed in, and it can also have mucus in it. So that was in our SVA as well. Abdo pain on the left side, and you can also get systemic symptoms. So fever, and anemia, and so on during the flares. And one of the key differences is, is the fact that uh, is the fact that ulcerative colitis is a relapsing and remitting disorder. So it's not a continual um, time frame of someone having constant diarrhea and constant abdominal pain. They all have these flares and during those flares, they can have these systemic symptoms, which we talked about, but it's not all the time. So that's again, another clue that it's ulcerative colitis over Crohn's. So we've uh, done a little table to um, discuss the differences. So as we mentioned, the gut layers which are affected are different. So Crohn's is all of the gut layers, whereas ulcerative colitis is the mucosa and the submucosa. Crohn's can affect anywhere from the mouth to the anus, but commonly the terminal ileum. And importantly, it's patchy inflammation. It's not a continuous inflammation from the mouth to the anus. You get these skip lesions. So one area might be affected and then the next area is not next part is, next part isn't. So we call those skip lesions, but it can occur anywhere from mouth to anus. If you compare that to ulcerative colitis, it usually affects the colon and the rectum, specifically the rectum, and it is continuous. There's no skip lesions. That whole area that's affected will have inflammation. Abscesses and fissures are common in Crohn's but not in ulcerative colitis. The diarrhea we discussed, so you can have blood in Crohn's, um, 
but you do definitely get it in ulcerative colitis and you might also get mucus. You get flares, but in between flares of ulcerative colitis, you're well. And then when you have the flare, you get those systemic symptoms. And importantly, surgery is only curative for ulcerative colitis, not Crohn's. So this is what we were talking about um, when I said there's a lot of symptoms that uh, were in the SBAs that didn't seem related to gastro at all. So with IBD, you get extra intestinal manifestations. So these are things in completely other parts of the body, other systems that are also affected. And you can remember that with the acronym a PISAC. So you get mouth ulcers, which is more common in Crohn's than is in ulcerative colitis. Pyoderma gangrenosum. So that's the picture on the top right. So that um, uh, ulcer that you can see there, which is very painful. The eye is eye. So you can get uveitis. Like in our SBA, um, the woman had red eyes. Erythema nodosum. So you can see that in the second picture. So that's um, a rash that sort of looks like bruising, which is commonly found on the shins. Sclerosing cholangitis arthritis and clubbing, again, more common in Crohn's than in ulcerative colitis. So that's that picture at the bottom right. Okay, so now moving on to what the imaging actually looks like for the two. So starting with Crohn's disease, if you do a colonoscopy, the kind of key terms that you'll see come up in SBAs, and also if you're trying to describe a colonoscopy, are deep ulcers, and a cobblestone appearance. So that's what this picture on the top left is. So I hope you can kind of understand why it's been dubbed cobblestone appearance. And um, you can see all these bumps um, along the GI tract. Histology um, will show you goblet cells and granulomas. And an X-ray with a barium enema will show rose thorn ulcers, which hopefully you can see in the bottom left picture where the yellow arrows are pointing. Um, so it's sort of bits sticking out like thorns. And then on the right, if you can see, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, but um, where this white arrow is pointing, this thin line is called a Cantor's string sign. So that's very specific to Crohn's. So hopefully you can see that. Okay. Moving on to ulcerative colitis, very different on imaging. Histology, the key things you're looking for are pseudopolyps crypt abscesses and goblet cell depletion. And then on x-rays, I hope you can see how different it is compared to Crohn's, there's a lot of haustrations. So you get this appearance on this left picture, you can see it's called a lead pipe. So rather than you seeing the different sections, it just looks like one long pipe on each section. So that's very classic of ulcerative colitis. And one of the complications that you can get from ulcerative colitis is toxic megacolon. So this is an emergency and you can see it um, on the picture on the right. So hopefully you can see this massive um, section of the colon that has been inflamed. Um, so that can be due to um, infection from, for example, C. difficile, um, but it is an emergency. So you get extreme vomiting, abdo pain and distension. So that's a really important complication to remember with ulcer ulcerative colitis. Hope that makes sense. So let's move on to management of IBD now. So this is another SBA for you guys. Okay, let's end the poll there. Uh, share results. So it's a bit of a split. Um, people have said A, B, C, and D. So it's okay if you don't know it, we'll go through this all. Uh, so hopefully you recognize from what we were talking about, mucoid, bloody diarrhea with the red marks, so that erythema nodosum. Um, is looking like it's ulcerative colitis. And the way that you start or induce treatment uh, for ulcerative colitis is topical mesalazine. So uh, one person got that, so congratulations for that person. Um, but don't worry uh, if you didn't get that, we'll go into detail in a second. Okay, let's do another question. Okay, good. It's looking like a lot of people um, have got this. So most people have put A, which is absolutely the right answer. So the important thing uh, which you've got, so it's the same guys, so we know it's ulcerative colitis still, 
and he's been on treatment, but for whatever reason, he's had a flare up, which we know can happen because it's relapsing remitting. And it's severe and it requires hospital admission. So oral just isn't gonna cut it. It's an emergency, it's really serious. So we have to go in with IV steroids. So well done. Good, and then last um, SBA for this section. Okay, so people seemed pretty split between B and D. So the answer is B. So this, um, I hope you guys worked out that this was Crohn's. So right iliac fossa pain, diarrhea, joint pain, erythema nodosum, and Cantor's string sign. So it's all pointing towards Crohn's. So this is again, initial management. So induction for Crohn's is steroids. So we give them prednisolone. Good. Okay, so this is a useful table to compare them both again. So if we start with Crohn's, so inducing remission, so that's the initial management that you would give them, you would start off with corticosteroids. Second line, you would give mesalazine, and then you'd move on. If it's quite severe, you would give infliximab, so TNF-alpha. And the important thing to remember with um, biologics, like infliximab, is that you would screen them for TB in case they have latent TB, which is very common in the population. I think it's one in three people have latent TB. But you want to make sure before you put them on something like infliximab, which will cause immunosuppression, that they definitely don't have TB, which will be activated, because obviously that's a whole other problem that you've just created for that person. So once you've induced remission, the maintenance therapy is um, azathioprine or mercaptopurin. And um, another thing you have to check before you start um, patients on this is their T, TPMT levels. Um, again, stepping up to methotrexate or cyclosporin if that doesn't work. And as we discussed before on the last table, surgery is not curative. So it's not super helpful in Crohn's. Ulcerative colitis, uh, very different um, management. So you would start them on amina salicylates. You'd start with topical, you'd step up to oral if that doesn't work, and give corticosteroids and in severe cases, so in our second SBA, um, the man that was hospitalized, you would give IV steroids. You'd give amino salicylates for remission as well, but if you're noticing that they're relapsing a lot, even on that treatment, suggest it's not working. So maybe you should give them azathioprine or mercaptopurin and remembering um, to check the levels before. And as we discussed, surgery is curative uh, for ulcerative colitis. So definitely something to be considered. Good. So um, before we move on, if anyone has any questions on inflammatory bowel disease, please put it in the chat and um, one of us can answer it. But otherwise we're gonna move on from IBD. So hope, hopefully everyone um, understood that. Okay, so next SBA. Okay, good. So people put, most people put D, which is great. That's the right answer. Um, I'm glad no one put B or C because hopefully we know that this doesn't fit in with those histories. So the reason that it is irritable bowel syndrome so it's a long history, it's not a sudden thing, which makes you think it's not something like gastroenteritis, which is usually some sort of um, infection that they've gotten, which causes sudden diarrhea, maybe after traveling, for example, it wouldn't be a two year history of, um, of things. It's intermittent diarrhea and constipation. She complains of bloating, abdo pain, and the abdo pain eases with defecation. So that's a really, specific phrase that fits in with irritable bowel syndrome. So if you see abdo pain that is better when uh, after going to the toilet, then you're thinking IBS. So um, let's talk about IBS now. So it's very common. Um, so you'll probably see a patient with this, maybe you know someone with it. Um, but like I said, the classic thing is abdo pain relieved by defecation you get bloating and irregular bowel habits. So in our SBA, the woman had, she had diarrhea and constipation, it was intermittent. So some sort of irregular bowel habits going on. But it's important to know that there are specific red flags with IBS that we really need to be um, 
considering and asking the patient. So any bleeding, any weight loss, if it's IBS in a woman over 60, that's quite concerning as well. And if there's a family history of bowel or ovarian cancer, so they're the red flags you'd be asking. Investigations, you'd check for ESR and CRP, so that's a measure for inflammation. Fecal cow protein. So this is one of the ways we can differentiate between IBS and IBD, so what we were talking about before. Fecal cow protein is high in IBD. So in IBS, if you think someone has IBS and um, they have a high fecal cow protein, you're probably looking down the wrong track. You would do a celiac screen as well. So we'll talk about celiac uh, a bit later on, um, but you would, you would screen them for that as well. And you would also do a CA125 marker in a woman over 50 that has suddenly developed these symptoms. And if you, if you don't know, a CA125 um, marker is a marker for ovarian cancer. So that's kind of linking in with our red flags. So um, it can present similarly, uh, but obviously it's very important that we catch that. And it, it presents most commonly with these kind of symptoms in a woman over 50. So definitely keep that in the back of your mind. Um, if um, the question or a patient you see has these symptoms, um, but is in this age group. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about celiac disease. Another SBA. Okay, we'll stop it there. It's a bit more of a spread um, for this question, which is fine, we'll go over it. Uh, so the answer is A, which majority of people did put. So this um, patient, kind of already told you, but has celiac disease. Um, so the question is asking, which test will best confirm her diagnosis? So that is asking for the gold standard treatment. So this is why it's really important um, in SBA, sometimes they'll want the initial management or the immediate management. Um, sometimes they'll ask for the, what initial test you'll be doing, but this is best confirmed. So this is your gold standard, which for celiac disease is endoscopy with duodenal biopsy. Yeah. So let's talk about celiac disease. So celiac disease is a chronic autoimmune disease of the small intestine caused by gluten intolerance, which leads to malabsorption, which is why you get the symptoms that the patient had um, in our SBA. So that autoimmune damage leads to villus atrophy, white blood cell infiltration, and cryptal hyperplasia. So again, these are kind of key buzzwords that you might see in an SBA that will make you think about celiac disease. It's a lot more common in women and there can sometimes be an autoimmune background. So if someone has type one diabetes or some sort of thyroid, autoimmune thyroiditis, for example, they're more susceptible to other autoimmune conditions such as celiac disease. And of course, if they have a family history of it as well. So the symptoms are steatorrhea. So in our question, um, that woman had stools that were difficult to flush. Sometimes it can come as its float. It's basically very kind of fatty um, stools. You get bloating, you get abdo pain, especially after gluten, eating gluten, obviously. Um, you can get fatigue because of that malabsorption. Um, you can get anemia um, and weight loss as well, again, because of the malabsorption. Um, you might also see there's IgA deficiency and in about, I think it's 2%, a uh, very small percentage of celiac patients will actually also have IgA deficiency. So that's something to consider um, if a patient presents with that. But if someone is Ig has this IgA deficiency, sometimes the screening test for celiac disease, which we'll talk about on the next slide, um, can sometimes come out negative. So Again, something to think about if a patient has classic celiac signs, but for some reason the screening has, uh, the markers have come back negative, you should be considering that maybe they have IgA deficiency as well. Anemia, we kind of mentioned before, causing the fatigue. So because of that malabsorption, you're not absorbing the iron, which you should be, which causes anemia. And so this is in our SVA, the woman had dermatitis herpetiformis. So that's what you can see here in this picture. So it's a rash, which 
can, which is linked to celiac disease, it's caused again by an autoimmune process. And you can get it commonly on the elbows and the knees, and it's usually um, symmetrical, which makes you think it's not just some sort of, you know, allergic rash or anything like that. The fact that it's symmetrical makes you think it's a bit more systemic. Okay, so the investigations. So some of you did um, say the right investigations that you would be doing antibody tests. Um, so they would be your initial tests, not your gold standard ones. So to TTG and anti-endomysial, um, they're the antibodies that you would be testing in the serum. The gold standard, which we discussed was endoscopy and duodenal biopsy, where you would get these classic, um, again, buzzwords to remember, um, these classic signs. So villus atrophy, cryptal hyperplasia, and intraepithelial white blood cells. An important thing to remember before you do this biopsy that you have to be on having gluten for six weeks before. So if a patient's come in and they say, oh, I did some research and I think I have celiac, so I stopped, um, I, I, I stopped having gluten, now I feel better. You can't do that biopsy then because that information has now gone down. So you need to say, okay, go back, reintroduce that gluten for six weeks, and then we can do the biopsy to tell um, for definite that it's celiac disease. So that's important. Um, kind of caveat to note that they have to have reintroduced gluten for at least six weeks before you can do the biopsy. Uh, the management, obviously, gluten-free diet, so no wheat, no barley, no rye. Dapsone is what you would give for that, um, the rash uh, that I showed you in the previous slide, so that dermatitis herpetiformis. You get functional hypersplenism in celiac disease. So essentially your spleens, starts to atrophy. You don't need to know too much about the process, but essentially it leaves you susceptible to a lot of encapsulated um, bacteria. So one of the things you have to consider in celiacs is giving them vaccines, specifically the pneumococcal and the influenza vaccines, which you might not have thought of for a GI condition, but it's because of this functional hyposplenism that you get with celiac disease. And also you would give them a vitamin D supplement. Okay, hey guys. Um, so I hope you can all hear me and see my screen. Let me know if you have any issues. Um, I just got a new laptop, so I'm having some technical difficulties, but let's hope this runs smoothly. Um, so yeah, following on from uh, Trevini's first half of the presentation, I'm gonna start off by talking about rectal bleeding. So um, let's jump in straight into it with an SBA. So a uh, 35 year old male presents to his GP following an episode of rectal bleeding. He notices fresh blood on the toilet paper after wiping. There was no blood mixed in with the stool. He adds that he's very sore down there and it is agony to defecate. There's no associated diarrhea or abdominal pain. Which condition is he likely to have? Okay. Um, so the correct answer is anal fissures, um, which most of you put, so that's great. Um, so we'll go through why in a second. So, um, Cool. So the most important thing to notice in this um, question is the fact that there is fresh blood. And when addressing cases where there's rectal bleeding, it's important to notice the type of blood that the patient describes. So whether it's fresh or dark, um, we'll give you an indication of what the cause is. So um, let's skip on and talk a bit about anal, anal fissures and then I'll come back to the question and we can review um, the signs and symptoms. So um, yeah. So anal fissures are tears in the squamous lining of the distal anal canal. Um, they can be both acute or chronic. Um, they can last. So if they last under six weeks, then it's acute. If it's over six weeks, then it's chronic. Um, they're more common in young white uh, males and risk factors include um, constipation, um, IBD and STIs, including HIV, syphilis and herpes. Um, so the classic features include painful, bright red, rectal bleeding. It's important to note that around 90% of fissures occur in the posterior midline. If the fissures are found in alternative locations, then the other underlying causes should be considered, such as Crohn's disease, um, because fissures are common in Crohn's disease, as Shavini mentioned earlier. Um, so let's go back to the question now. And 
Um, so yeah, if you notice here, so it's a 35 year old male, so young male, as we spoke about, um, fresh blood, which is um, typical for an anal fissure. And um, something to bear in mind is differentiate, differentiating anal fissures from hemorrhoids. So um, in anal fissures, you'll notice that the patient describes that it's quite sore down there and it's um, painful to defecate, whereas in hemorrhoids, it's almost it's um, painless bleeding. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. And um, the patient also notices that um, the blood is on, uh, it comes on after wiping, as opposed to IBD, which should be blood mixed in with the stool. Um, it says here as well that there's no blood mixed in with the stool. So, cool. So if we move on to the management. So management includes treatment of any associated constipation. This is just to relieve any pressure and straining. Um, so you would give laxatives and add fiber to the diet. Um, you can also give topical analgesics and topical uh, vasodilators such as dilatizum or GTN. So this just relaxes the muscle um, and makes it easier to defecate. And then if the GTN doesn't work um, after they say about six to eight weeks, then you can consider surgical management. Okay, so we briefly spoke about hemorrhoids and um, being able to notice the difference between hemorrhoids and anal fissures. So hemorrhoids, um, I'll quickly skip over the pathophysiology because you guys can look this up. And it's more important to understand the clinical presentation and the differences. Um, so like I said, so hemorrhoids will also present with bright um, red blood. Um, however, when differentiating hemorrhoids and anal fissures, um, it's important to know that hemorrhoids um, appear with painless bleeding. Um, so anal fissures are painful and hemorrhoids are painless. Um, the only time hemorrhoids will be painful is if the um, hemorrhoid is thrombosed. And this normally happens if it's um, located externally. So you can get both external and internal hemorrhoids, um, but external ones are more prone to thrombosis. So if there is pain, um, look out for that. So the management for hemorrhoids is again the same to soften the stool so it just makes it easier to defecate and prevent straining. Um, therefore, again, um, increased dietary fibers. Um, this is also because, that, uh, because of the fact that hemorrhoids tend to develop from increased pressure in the rectum, so on straining. Um, so just easing that will um, make it easier for the patient. And um, there are also non-surgical and surgical options if the hemorrhoids are causing severe symptoms. So in the next section, we'll focus on a bit of theory and look at bowel obstruction. So firstly, small bowel obstruction. Um, so small bowel obstruction is a blockage in the small intestine. It is usually caused by scar tissue. So if patients had a previous surgery um, or a hernia or cancer. So the most common obstructions are a result of prior surgeries. The bowel will form bands of scar tissue called adhesions after an operation, and this makes the bowel just kind of stick together. And it will commonly present with central abdominal pain, nausea, and acute vomiting, um, as well as abdominal distension and um, an empty rectum. Um, often on like an abdominal examination, you'll hear tinkling bowel sounds. So that's a red flag to look out for. Um, so the way to diagnose is actually just by imaging. So you'll do an um, abdominal x-ray and you'll see something that looks a bit like this. So in this picture, you see small centrally dilated bowel loops, um, as you can see on the image on the right here. Um, and that, yeah, that's indicative of small bowel obstruction. Um, when we move on to looking at large bowel obstruction, you'll be able to see the difference to um, be able to differentiate that on an x-ray. So the definitive management of bowel obstruction is dependent on the etiology. So what's actually caused the obstruction and whether it's um, complicated or not. So what I mean by that is, is if there's ischemia or perforation or any peritonitis or anything. Um, it's important to know that treatment is based on fluid management. So these patients are often fluid deplete. And so the initial management will be conservative. So um, the goal is to just relieve the discomfort and restore the normal fluids and electrolytes. Um, so the first treatment is called a drip and suck method. Um, so what you do is you make the patient know by mouth, you insert an NG tube to decompress the bowel, hence um, suck, and then you start IV fluids to correct the fluids. 
um, and uh, restore any electrolytes um, to the correct balance. Um, and that's what is meant by drip. Um, you can also manage this by inserting a catheter and um, this is just to restore the electrolyte balance as well. And as well as prescribing um, analgesia just for pain relief. So this is different to a large bowel obstruction, um, which occurs when there is a blockage in the colon. So this um, occurs as a result most commonly um, by colorectal carcinoma. So this, like it says, is a 90% of people. Um, it can lead to swelling of the intestine and it because, it, because it prevents food or gas from passing through. Um, if the blockage and swelling are severe, then the bowel can rupture or the blood supply can be interrupted. And that's what we're most worried about. Um, it is most commonly caused by colorectal carcinoma, like I said, but it can also be caused by fecal impaction or diverticular disease or a volvulus, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, patients with a large bowel obstruction um, will have central abdominal pain, constant. They'll also have vomiting, but it will occur later than in a small bowel obstruction. Um, and you also hear the same tinkling bowel sounds. That's why it's important to do an x-ray to differentiate between the two. So um, when you do an x-ray, this is what you'll see. So it will be dilated circumferentially, oh, circumferentially located bowel loops. Um, like you can see here, it's pretty wide and um, you can see that the bowel is quite distended. And um, we'll treat this with surgery as first step management. So um, what a volvulus is. So um, I just briefly mentioned it, but basically it's just twisting a bowel on its own mesentery. So it occurs mostly with the sigmoid colon um, and it can occur with the sequel, but not as commonly. Um, it is an emergency. And so it's, it's um, necessary to identify this early so that the patient can get management. Um, it results in compromised blood flow and closed loop obstruction. Um, so like I said, it normally affects the sigmoid portion of the colon. Um, this is where the large bowel obstruction is caused by the sigmoid colon twisting on the sigmoid mesocolon. Um, it's more common in older patients than those with chronic constipation, those with neurological conditions such as Parkinson's disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and psychiatric conditions such as schizophrenia. Um, features include constipation, abdominal pain, um, nausea and vomiting. You can diagnose this again with an um, abdominal x-ray and what you'll see is the common coffee bean sign. So this is something that comes up in multiple choice questions all the time. As what you can see here, it kind of looks like a coffee bean. It's around, around the outside and there's a little line in the middle. Um, so that just shows the bowel um, folding in on itself. Um, so like I said, a cecal volvulus is much less common because the cecum, it tends to be a retroperitoneal structure. So it's not really at risk of twisting. However, if there is a developmental failure or something that's gone wrong, then um, this can happen to the cecum. Um, some patients will be just at more of an increased risk of developing it. So it's just worth noting that. Um, and the, yeah, the management for sigmoid um, volvulus is a rigid sigmoidoscopy and the fetus tube insertion. And for sequel volvulus, um, it's a right hemicolectomy. Moving on, so uh, let's talk about colorectal cancer. So firstly, it's worth knowing that colorectal cancer is the third most common type of cancer in the UK and the second most cause of cancer deaths. Um, most colorectal cancers are located in the rectum. So let's take a look at the risk factors and the presentation. So with regards to risk factors, um, a big risk factor is pre-existing neo neoplastic polyps. Um, they're just growths that appear above the mucosa. They carry a risk of malignant transformation. Um, so yeah, so they're often benign, but they can be precancerous. So it's just worth noting that if patients do have polyps um, due to maybe like a pre-existing genetic condition, then it's worth just monitoring it and um, making sure that they don't become malignant. So um, IBD is also a risk factor, particularly ulcerative colitis, um, as well as genetic conditions such as um, FAP and HNPCC, also known as Lynch, syn Lynch syndrome. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit more later in the presentation, but these are essentially um, conditions that can cause uh, neoplastic polyps. So something to just look out for. 
Um, another risk factor is previous cancer, as well as a low fiber and a diet high in red meat, as well as um, increased alcohol intake and smoking. So um, these patients will present differently depending on where the cancer is located. So if it's left-sided or right-sided. Um, so if the cancer is located on the left-hand side, you'll see more bleeding and mucus in the stool. They might have um, altered bowel habit or obstruction. Um, they'll also have tenesmus and uh, mass in the rectum. Whereas if it's right-sided, you'll see a lot more of the typical cancer symptoms. So the weight loss and decreased hemoglobin as well as um, some abdominal pain. And obstruction is a lot less likely if it's on the right side than if it's on the left side. Um, so it's just worth bearing in mind because obviously it will change the treatment and affect like which part of the colon is surgically removed in the management phase. So if we look at investigations and staging, um, the first investigation is to do a full blood count. You'll be able to see microcystic anemia uh, due to the chronic disease. And um, on the fecal occult blood test, um, yeah, so you do a fecal occult blood test and you also do a CEA. And CEA is just a marker. And if it's raised, um, then it can indicate presence of uh, colorectal cancer. In terms of imaging, you do a colonoscopy and then a biopsy, which is the gold standard. Um, and then you also do a CT, thor thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, if the cancer is limited to the colon, um, you'll be able to see that on the CT. If it's spread rectally, then you'll need to do a pelvic MRI as well, um, or a transrectal ultrasound if it's just localized. You also do a PET scan just to make sure and see if, the, um, if there's any metastasis or progression. Um, here's just a diagram of the TNM staging of cancer. Um, so obviously it ranges from like TX to T4 and then um, NX to N2 and then, oh yeah, NX to N2 and then M0 to M1, depending on if, it, on if it's metastasized or not. So um, cancer of the colon is nearly always treated with surgery, um, but it just depends, depends on the stage. Um, so resectional surgery is really the only curative management um, and we do uh, radiotherapy and chemo alongside just as supportive treatment. Um, so this procedure is tailored to the patient depending on where the cancer is actually located and um, it can also depend on the patient's confounding factors. So if they do have a genetic condition that has predisposed them to the cancer, then um, it may change the type of surgical procedure that is done. So for stage one to three, a hemicolectomy is done, which is just partial removal of the large colon. Um, and obviously, like it, depending on the site of the cancer, that's the, you'll remove different parts of the colon. Um, and if it's a sigmoidal cancer, you will do a total sigmoidectomy. You also remove the regional lymph nodes and do post-op chemo, um, just as supportive management. Um, for stage four cancer, you do resection of the tumor and metastasis if suitable. Um, you'll then do stenting if the patient is unsuitable for surgery, just to prevent obstruction and perforation, which are um, acute. Um, you also want to do pre and post-op chemotherapy with radiotherapy as well. If the cancer is confined to the rectum, um, if the patient is stage one, they are fairly low risk. So you can just do a local excision by transanal surgery. Um, if they are stage one, but high risk, then you do pre-op radiotherapy with a radical surgery. Again, depending on the location, um, that changes the part of the rectum that you operate on. Um, stage two to three, you do radical surgery plus preoperative chemotherapy and postoperative chemotherapy. And stage four, you do primary tumor and metastatic resection, as well as palliative chemo radiotherapy. Here are the different surgical techniques depending on the location of the cancer and the suitability of the patient for surgery. Um, so it's just a brief overview. If you guys wanna go back and review any of this, then feel free to. So I won't dwell on too long about the genetic conditions because they are quite complicated and there is a lot um, to say about them, but here is a brief overview. Again, I'll whiz through this. And then if you wanna go back and take a look after the slides have been released, um, feel free. Same with the screening. Okay, so let's move on to the acute abdomen now. So firstly, I'll be talking about diverticular disease. So this is a common surgical problem where the colonic mucosa kind of herniates through the muscular wall of the colon. The herniations in the outpatches are referred to as the diverticular. 
and um, it typically affects the sacromoid colon. So diverticular disease typically presents um, with constipation and left, low, le left lower quadrant abdominal pain. Some patients will also experience rectal bleeding. So that's important, an important differential to be aware of as well. Um, the physical examination may be normal, um, or there may be tenderness in the left lower quadrant on, um, and on a digital rectal examination. So um, diverticulitis is a complication, and this occurs when there is inflammation of the diverticular. So this condition affects, typically affects patients over the age of 50 who consume a low fiber diet, um, normally that of a, like a Western diet. Um, it presents, like I said, it presents acutely with left lower quadrant abdominal pain, it can also have associated fever and nausea or vomiting. Um, on physical examination, there's often pyrexia um, because of the infection. And again, left lower quadrant tenderness um, and guarding. So um, something to look out for is diffuse abdominal tenderness because it could be suggestive of generalized peritonitis, generalized peritonitis or perforation. So with regards to investigations, it's important to screen for infection and um, if the patient's hemodynamically compromised because it will need to be treated urgently. An abdominal X-ray is also required um, to assess for perforation. And the diagnosis can be done by carrying out a CT scan. Um, it's important to remember to not carry out a colonoscopy because this can perforate the diverticular if they haven't been already. So the management for diverticular disease. So patients who are asymptomatic and just have out pouches forming, which may have been picked up on imaging, and no treatment is actually required. If patients present with symptoms, then they're advised to increase their dietary fiber intake and hydration. Um, if the patients present with infection, so diverticulitis, then you can manage with seven days of oral antibiotics, um, such as Comoxiclav, and um, uh, analgesia may also be required. Uh, it's worth noting that if patients fail to improve after 72 hours with oral antibiotics, then admission to hospital might be necessary. Um, and if the patient has severe rectal bleeding, then you will need to do hemodynamic stabilization and potentially surgery. So um, moving on to our second emergency, which is abdominal aortic aneurysms. So they're common and potentially life-threatening conditions, so therefore need to be picked up quickly and treated with, and uh, made sure they're treated with efficiently. So without repair, uh, ruptured AA is usually fatal. It is the dilatation of a region of the aorta due to um, atherosclerotic tissue buildup. Um, so similar risk factors will be associated with AA as they are with like um, an MI and stroke and things. So age, if the patient is smoking, um, any trauma, cardiovascular disease or connective tissue and inflammatory disorders. Um, patients may be asymptomatic, but you will just notice an expansile and pulsatile um, um, abdominal aorta on examination. So um, screening you can do by ultrasound scan. So um, in the UK, screening is offered at age 65 and above. So if there's a small A, you just do a yearly repeated ultrasound or no follow-up at all, depending on the, um, so if it's less than three centimeters, you don't have to do any further follow-up. If it's three to 4.5, then you do annual monitoring. Um, if it's medium size, so between like 4.5 to 5.5 centimeters, then you do um, monitoring every three months. If it's above 5.5, then surgery generally recommended. You can do an open repair or an endovascular aneurysm repair, which is where you insert a stent. If it ruptures, it's a critical emergency. So you're, the patient will generally present with central abdominal pain radiating to the back and the groin. Um, it may be similar to renal colic, so it's one of the differentials if the patient comes in with similar um, pain complaints. They may have severe hypertension as well um, and shock. So that's something to be aware of. Um, like I said, they may have renal colic symptoms as well, especially if they're over the age of 65, be concerned about ruptured AAA. So management for a rupture is to go with the A to E approach to also do an ECG um, to run an amylase test. Um, however, if they come in with severe symptoms, it's best to just go straight to theater and don't waste time on any imaging. Um, in theatre, the aorta is clamped down and um, a graft bypass is the method of um, treatment done.
So after a lot of theory, let's go back to um, an SBA. So Mr. Davies is a 38 year old man who presents to Amy with a painful red bulge protruding from the right iliac fossa of his abdomen that can't be reduced and a fever. He noticed before that it had existed for two months and grew larger when coughing. He mentions that he had an appendectomy a couple of years ago. What is the most appropriate next step management? Um, so most of you put answer C, which is correct. Um, so well done. Um, so the right answer is to send for emergency laparotomy. And this is because oh, this person is presenting with a strangulated hernia. So let's talk a bit about hernias and then I'll come back to this and we can see what the signs are pointing towards this diagnosis and why this is the correct management. So um, an abdominal hernia is a protrusion of an organ or um, yeah, or the fascia of an organ through the abdominal wall of the cavity. Um, so it's often peritoneal. Um, the two most common locations where abdominal hernias occur um, are either femoral or inguinal. Um, other locations include things like umbilical, paraumbilical, epigastric and incisional hernias. Um, risk factors include um, forays, so adipose tissue, so if the patient is overweight, um, age, so if they're older, um, ascites, um, and abdominal surgery. So um, normally they'll present with a palpable lump, um, especially on coughing, you'll be able to notice it a bit more. It will increase in size um, due to the increased abdominal pressure. And um, the investigations to do, it's mainly a clinical diagnosis. So if the patient comes in and is coughing and you can clearly see the red bulge, then um, it will point towards indication that this is a hernia. Um, however, if you are unsure and if the signs um, aren't pointing towards it clearly, then you can do an ultrasound scan um, and a CT if the patient is obese because it will just be easier to see. So if we go back to the um, question now, so we can see here that the patient is presenting with a painful red bulge. Um, so that's clearly indicative of a hernia, which is protruding from the right iliac fossa. Um, of his abdomen. And um, something that points towards the fact that this is a strangulated hernia is normally that hernias can be reduced. So you, if you push it down with your hand, it tends to go back in. However, if you can't do that, then um, it shows that the, um, there's something wrong with the hernia and it's referred to as um, being incarcerated. And these hernias are at risk of strangulation. So it's something to look out for. Um, the fever points towards something a bit more serious as well. Um, so strangulation is a surgical emergency where the blood supply to the her herniated tissue is compromised and this can lead to ischemia or necrosis. So um, the indications of a strangulated hernia, so I think this is on, a, on the next slide, so let's just move on. Yeah, so um, like I was saying about the strangulated hernia, so um, you need to quickly get the patient to theatre in this situation because you worry about the bowel being um, necrotized and infected. Uh, so yeah, so you want to operate straight away. So you do an emergency open surgery um, to relieve the strangulation and then assess the bowel viability by examining the colour, pulsations and bowel tone, um, including observing peristalsis. And then you want to just remove any necrotized bowel and um, put in a mesh layer and uh, try to prevent the bowel from protruding again. For a non-strangulated hernia, it's normally a bit more of a conservative approach. So if it's small and asymptomatic, they can often resolve by themselves given enough time. Um, so most umbilical hernias will just um, sort themselves out over time. Um, however, if, if, the, if the surgeons decide to operate, um, then the typical surgery includes doing a mesh repair. So this is to strengthen the abdominal wall. Um, and you put mesh in place and this prevents the bowel from protruding out again. Um, so yeah, so you can do a total extra peritoneal approach. So it's open surgery with the mesh layer inserted from above. Um, and it's done when the superficial wall is very weak and um, often that's the cause of why the bowel is protruding out in the first place. Or you can do a traps and abdominal peritoneal approach, which is um, done laparoscopically with the mesh layer inserted into the abdomen and attached from below. 
So um, here are all the locations of where the um, hernias can present. Um, so I'll just skip through this, but you can go back and have a look. Okay, so let's move on to our last SBA of the presentation. So a 10 year old boy comes into A&E with a one day history of abdominal pain in the right iliac fossa and a fever. On palpation, the, the, on the left iliac fossa, he says that he can feel pain on the right side. His father tells you that he vomited once just before coming into A&E. Which of the following should be done immediately? So most of you put C, but actually the correct answer is B. And this is because um, it says which of the following should be done first. Um, although the patient will need an appendectomy um, at some point, um, the first thing to do is to give prophylactic IV broad spectrum antibiotics. And this is because um, you give this to the patient before surgery to risk, reduce the risk of infections post-surgery. So now if we look at the question again, um, you can see that the patient presented with a right iliac fossa pain and a fever. Um, he also said that on the left iliac fossa, he can feel pain on the, when, when um, palpating left iliac fossa, he can feel pain on the right side, which is common for um, uh, an infected appendix. And, um, his father tells you that he's vomited once. So this patient actually has a ruptured appendix and these are the common signs of that. He also has raised leukocytes and a raised CRP, which um, should point towards the diagnosis of some sort of infection going on. So if we move on to talk about acute appendicitis. Um, so patients normally present with umbilical pain radiating to the right iliac fossa. They also present with tachycardia, pyrexia, um, guarding a rebound tenderness in McBurney's point, um, as well as Rob, Rob Singh's sign, which is um, right iliac fossa pain when the left iliac fossa is uh, pressed, which is what this patient had. The investigations are to assess for sepsis. So you have to stabilize first um, if the patient is in shock. If they are high risk or um, the, that you're sure that the diagnosis is most likely acute appendicitis, then a diagnostic laparoscopy is um, generally done. If the patient is female and um, within childbearing age, then a pregnancy test should be done just to exclude that out, just to exclude out an ectopic pregnancy. If you are unsure, then ultrasound scan can be done and then a CT. Um, management for acute appendicitis or a ruptured appendix, you want to eventually do a laparoscopic appendicectomy, um, but you want to give broad spectrum antibiotics first pre-surgery just to prevent any infection post-surgery. Um, and you want to give longer duration of antibiotics if the appendix has ruptured or is perforated. Okay, great. So I think that brings us to the end of the presentation.